In this video, we will tell you what happened to Alice Gross. Alice Gross was born on Valentine's Day, February 14, 2000 in London. She grew up in a full loving family. She also had an older sister. From an early age, the girl showed an affinity for creativity. She loved to draw and play the piano on violin. Later, Alice began to write her own gorgeous songs and performed them to her own music. In addition, the girl was fond of Caleb's design and at age 11 even made herself a dress, which she planned to wear at a school graduation. When the girl was 13 years old, doctors died almost her with anorexia and depression. Despite all of this, Alice continued to pursue creativity and every chance of achieving tremendous success in the future. On August 28, 2014, Alice told her mother that she was going on an outing. She had school vacations and plenty of free time, so the girl looked to walk along a small water canal and river near her home. The family lived in a suburb of London called Hanwell, and her usual routes was 4.5 kilometers. The girl went out at about 3 p.m., promising her parents she would return around 6 p.m. She later texted her father she would be home soon, but Alice did not return at the appointed time. And when it was already 7 p.m. on the clock, her parents began to worry. They tried calling her, but her phone was off. The fact that Alice suffered anorexia and depression only added to her anxiety. Her parents feared something might have happened to her because of her physical condition, she was constantly weak and could faint. Her parents called some of her friends in the hope that Alice might be with them, but no. One had seen the girl that day, and her mother and father decided to call the police. They immediately began a search, and the first thing they did was to investigate the route Alice usually took. Her relatives and friends of the family also joined the search. Alas, they could not find any trace of the girl, but detectives were able to find several witnesses. Thanks to their testimony about the places where Alice had passed, the police were able to determine her route more accurately, which in turn allowed them to narrow the search area and select several street cameras that could have captured her. After examining the footage, detectives did locate Alice. Almost immediately after leaving the house, she was caught on the first camera, heading along the Grand Union Canal. A short time later, she was spotted in the Bryan Ford area, which was further down the canal. The last time the camera captured her was on her way back near her home. The girl was walking near the Trapper's Way Bridge. The police also reported the missing teenager to the media, and they broke the news about the case all over London. In the first hours after her disappearance, thanks to that, detectives received several calls from witnesses who had seen Alice. Unfortunately, none of this brought the police any closer to finding the girl. Based on camera footage and witness accounts, she disappeared on her way home, having traveled most of her usual route. But what happened to her remained a mystery. Three days went by as police continued to examine camera footage in nearby neighborhoods and surveyed local parks and other secluded areas. At the same time, patrol officers went door to door to homes along Alice's route and asked questions of local residents. On September 1st, the girl's relatives recorded a video message begging her to return home. They also asked anyone who had any information about her whereabouts to contact the police. At the time, investigators were considering several theories. The first and most troubling was the kidnapping version. Despite the fact that most of Alice's route was along city streets, there were many remote and hidden areas where the girl might have been attacked. In addition, the London police often encountered situations where people kidnapped, right in the center, let alone in the suburbs. The second was a theory about running away from home. Alice's parents feared that depression might have driven her to such a decision. They also didn't rule out the possibility that the girl might have taken her own life because of her illness, but to the police, this version seemed unlikely. At 14, Alice was unlikely to be able to run away and hide, especially without help. And if she had taken her own life, she would very likely have been found by now. The case attracted more and more public attention every day. And on September 3rd, it was handed over to a special unit of Scotland Yard. Although they usually only worked on homicides, the detectives rated the chance of getting the girl home as high. Scotland Yard organized a large-scale search, which was immediately joined by hundreds of volunteers. After seeing the heartbreaking appeal of her parents and sister in the news concerned, 
Londoners combed the area from early morning until late at night. And the next day, detectives announced the discovery of the first tangible clue. They managed to find Alice's backpack which contained her shoes worn that day. It was relatively close to her home. This find allowed the police to narrow their search focusing on a small area near the canal. Investigators realized it was unlikely the girl had taken off her shoes herself, thrown them in with her backpack and fled. She did not have a change of shoes with her, so the situation became more and more complicated. Scotland Yard decided to release all available surveillance footage of Alice. The backpack with the shoes indicated that the girl might be in serious danger. The main version was still an abduction, but the investigators did not completely rule out the possibility that the girl might have committed suicide. For that reason, they try to use all available resources to locate her. The publication of the recordings might draw more attention among the public, and someone might remember seeing Alice that day. Along with that, several hundred more people from various agencies were involved in. The search and there were already 600 people working on the case. The investigation was thus the largest since 2005 in terms of the number of police officers involved. Some of them were directly surveying the area, while others were examining footage. From hundreds of cameras that could have captured Alice, Scotland Yard also heard the £20,000 reward for any information that could help find the girl. Although police were unable to locate her phone, they asked the cell phone company for details of its less known location. It turned out that Alice had sent a message to her father from practically the same place where they would later find her backpack. Everything indicated that the investigators needed to focus on that particular location. The decision was made to conduct a thorough inspection of an area of several square kilometers. Every meter of land and water was examined manually. Police teams literally probed the river and canal bottoms for any evidence. Two days after the discovery of the backpack, it became known that the police arrested a 25-year-old man on suspicion of Alice's murder. The next day, they arrested another man, but refused to comment on the situation until all the details were clarified. However, soon both suspects were released and Scotland Yard stated that they were unable to establish the involvement of these two people in Alice's disappearance. More than a week passed, and during all that time, there was no progress in the case. It was only on September 16th that the police made another statement. They said they were looking for a 41-year-old man named Arna Sawkins in connection with Alice's disappearance. He moved to England from Latvia seven years ago. He lived in the area and worked as a construction worker. Scotland Yard became interested in him for two reasons that at first glance seemed unrelated. First, Arns's co-worker reported him to the police about his disappearance as earliest. September 3rd. The man did not show up for work, did not answer his phone, and was not at home. It seemed as if he had simply vanished. Second, detectives found that Sawkins' route from home to work was roughly the same. Route that the girl had taken the day she disappeared. All of this was not yet enough to draw any conclusions about man's involvement in a girl's disappearance. But detectives soon discovered something really disturbing. In one of the camera recordings, a sorrow middle-aged man riding his bicycle across the bridge where Alice had passed just a few minutes before. This man turned out to be Salkins. A short time later, he came to the next camera and heard that the tech ives noticed a very strange moment. The journey between these cameras should have taken only a few minutes, and it took the man on the bicycle practically a whole hour to ride down this road. A reasonable question arose. What was he doing all that time on such a short stretch? The police investigated the area and concluded that he could not have taken the longer route to the next cell because there simply was none. Even more disturbing was the fact that all this was taking place in the very area where Alice's path was allegedly cut short. The cops also concluded that the man's clothes were wet when he pulled onto the road. Continuing to study the cameras, detectives noticed so cons on his bicycle returning to the same location two hours later after riding back out 50 minutes later. In doing so, he was not caught on the camera located on the bridge. This indicated that the man had spent all that time inside a small blind spot. Besides, he was already wearing different clothes. About an hour later, he was caught on a camera at a local store buying beer. The next morning, the situation repeated itself. Zawkins returned to the same spot between the cameras at about 7 o'clock and also returned there again in the evening. 
All this was enough to get a search warrant for his house. It turned out that the man was living there with his girlfriend and their two daughters. Together. His roommate also had no idea where Salkins had gone. When she learned that he was suspected of killing the girl, she stated that Ernest could. Never do something like that. She described him as a caring and loving father. Along with this, Scotland Yard examined the man's biography and discovered a truly creepy moment. It turned out that the Saul cop had a rich criminal past. In 1998, being in Latvia, he killed his wife and called blood and calculatedly. Having dug a grave for her in the woods for which he got only seven years in prison. After serving his sentence, he moved to England and the local law enforcement. Agencies did not even know about his criminal record in his home country. Police officers searched Zakin's home and found a recently excavated plot of land on his property. They did not disclose whether they found an evidence there, but a significant find awaited them in the basement of their house. A broken back panel from a white iPhone 4S was found there. Alice had the exact same phone. After examining the contents of his computer, the police also discovered that the man had searched the incident for information about Alice Gross's disappearance a few days after the incident. On the basis of all this, Ernest Sawkins was put on the wanted list. Scotland Yard feared that the man might have fled back to Latvia or another European country, so they searched all over the EU, but law enforcement authorities were unable to find a single trace of the suspect. Meanwhile, a month had passed since Alice's disappearance, and on September 30th, police issued a depressing statement. A human body was found in a river near the Gill's disappearance. At the time, the identity was not yet known, but police shared one eerie fact. Someone had gone to great lengths to arrange for the body to remain underwater and not resurface. Only the next day, law enforcement authorities confirmed that the deceased was Alice. Gross, though number one doubted it anymore. The scene was in the exact spot where she had disappeared. The cause of death was asphyxiation. It turned out that Alice's buddy had been wrapped in construction bags and tied to a large tree stump. In addition, the perpetrator made a whole structure out of a bicycle wheel and bricks, which also prevented the body from surfacing. She also had no clothes on except for one sock. Detectives pay the visit to the setup where Sawkins worked and discovered that the same bags used to hide Alice's body were the same ones used at his construction site. After the discovery of the body, please continue to search for Sawkins, working closely with Interpol on local European intelligence agencies, but they were still unable to find any trace of him. This went on until October 4th when investigators made an expected discovery. They discovered the man's suspended body in a park just one kilometer from where Alice was murdered. Two days later, experts confirmed that the deceased was Ernest Sawkins. Number one expected such a turn of events. The main version of Scotland Yard was the escape of the suspect to Europe. Well, in fact, it turned out that all this time he was under their noses. Medical experts concluded that the man had committed suicide on the day of his disappearance, September 3rd, and that he could not be found for a month. Nothing surprising here, however. Sokins had chosen a very remote and hard-to-reach location where he was. Extremely difficult to spot. With Zokin's DNA in hand, investigators had even more evidence. Near where Alice's body was found, please found a cigarette, but which was sent to a lab. Experts extracted DNA from the filter, which matched the Zalkin sample. In addition, the lab said that it was highly likely that the perpetrator's DNA was found on the victim's body. They could not assert this with 100% certainty due to how long the body had been underwater. His DNA was also found on the girl's backpack and shoes. By that time, police had discovered another gruesome fact. It turned out that two years after moving to England, Sawkins had molested a 14-year-old girl just a kilometer away from where Alice's body was found. The man attempted some indecent act, but the victim survived and the man was arrested. This is where the fun part begins. The girl did not press formal charges and the perpetrator was simply released. It is not entirely clear how this could have happened. But the fact remains, an adult man molested a girl, fell into the hands of the police and escaped punishment. Moreover, information about this case surfaced after the perpetrator's body was found in the park. Despite all this, the police continued to investigate, and it took them some time to put together a picture of what had happened. 
According to their version, on an unfortunate day, August 20th 8th, Soxens was riding his bicycle along the same route where Alice was walking. Having noticed her in a secluded area, hidden from prying eyes, he attacked her in order to commit depraved acts. How events unfolded next, we shall never know, but the outcome was tragic. So Kant's killed Alice and then hit her body in several approaches, constantly. Returning to the place, we will also never know why he decided to take his own life after what he had done. Whether this can be called a manifestation of conscience is very debatable. Alice's parents, who survived such a terrible tragedy, were outraged by the government's actions. They were perplexed how the British authorities allowed a convicted murderer to enter the country and stay here to live. They had spent years fighting for the government to increase its control over migrants and keep criminals out. Unfortunately, to this day, they have been unable to make any serious changes. A month after the discovery of Zulkin's body, another interesting event occurred. The medical examiner in charge of the investigation left a folder of case documents on the train. The 30 pages contained important information about the murder, including medical information and undisclosed detail. The public, the media, and Alice's parents harshly criticized the police, but there was nothing they could do about it. However, number one tried to judge the deceased perpetrator anyway. The investigators said that if he were alive, they would have had enough evidence to bring the case to court, but there was no guarantee of a conviction. The problem was that all the evidence against Salkins was circumstantial, and he had a small chance of getting away with it. Instead, a hearing was held in court in which the jury admitted an already obvious fact. Alice had been murdered. Her death was not an accident. The procedure was formal and played no role. Alice's funeral was held on October 23rd. Thousands of people came out to the memorial that day, and at the end of the ceremony, a beautiful song that the girl rolled and sank herself was shown on the big screen. Next, we will tell you the story of Molly Tibbetts and what her disappearance led to. Molly Tibbetts was born on May 8, 1988 in San Francisco, California. When she was in second grade, her parents divorced and Molly moved to Iowa with her. Mother and two brothers her father, however, continued to maintain a close relationship with his children. After high school, she enrolled Iowa State University as a psychology major. In her spare time, she worked at a day camp at the Regional Medical Center. She had an active lifestyle, played sports, and had many friends. She spent the summer of 2018 in a tiny town called Brooklyn, which is also in Iowa. It is barely over 3 kilometers in size and only has 1,400 people living there. It would seem that in such a quiet place, where everyone knows each other, nothing terrible could happen. On July 18th, 2018, Molly was going for a run. She was living in Brooklyn with her boyfriend, Bolton Jack, at his brother's house. On the evening of that day, she was in the house alone. Her boyfriend was away at work in another town 210 kilometers from Brooklyn. Molly sent him a picture on Snapchat and went out for a run at about 7.30 p.m. The next day, Molly was supposed to go to work, but she never showed up. This seriously disturbed her family and boyfriend. They all knew that the girl was extremely responsible and never missed work without warning. In addition, she did not respond to calls and messages. As a result, the parents decided to contact the police who began a search for Molly. From the early days, the case began to attract increased attention across America. As for the residents of Brooklyn, for them, the disappearance of a young girl was a real shark. Nothing like this had ever happened in this tiny town before. People had never locked their doors and were sure of their own safety. Molly's father, Rob Tibbetts, came to Brooklyn from San Francisco and took an active part in the search. He handed out flyers with her photographs, questioned people, and tried in every way to help the investigation. Parents did not give up hope until the very last moment that their daughter would be found alive and unharmed. Three agencies got involved in the search for the girl. The Iowa Division of Criminal Investigations, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Powashik County Police Department. Together, they worked more than 2,000 leads and interviewed about 500 people. The search for Molly was scattered throughout Brooklyn's neighborhoods. At one point, law enforcement received a report that Molly had been spotted at her truck. Stop in Kearney, Missouri 380 miles from Brooklyn. 
please check this information and could find no confirmation. The police says is proper in such cases, check the theory that her boyfriend was involved. Statistically, most crimes of this nature are committed by relatives or loved ones, but not this time. Boyfriend's alibi was ironclad. He really was in another city and physically couldn't have been in Brooklyn that night. Time passed, and the search for Molly yielded no results. The Criminal Investigations Division announced the cash reward for any leading to the Gill's return, alive and unharmed. The amount grew steadily and eventually reached $366,000. This was very substantial money even by U.S. standards. And for the state of Iowa, the reward was a record at one point. Police said they were. Narrowing the search for Molly to a few locations around Brooklyn, her boyfriend's house, several local farms, a gas station, a truck stop, and a car wash, or none of it, helped locate Molly. The police received hundreds of leads, each of which led to a dead end. There was one episode, however, that struck me as odd. The owner of one of the pig farms where the police concentrated their search was extremely reluctant to contact law enforcement. He denied any involvement in Molly's disappearance, but refused to take a polygraph. Examination. All this made him an excellent candidate for the role of suspect, but there was no evidence against him. This meant that the police could neither interrogate the man nor search his farm property. As a result, the investigation was again at a standstill. The police tried to find some connection between the farm and Molly's disappearance, but they were unsuccessful at least at the time. That all changed on the August 20th first. A few days earlier, a law enforcement source told reporters that the police had found a body of a young white woman. Of course, everyone immediately assumed it was Molly, and they were right. On August 20th first, the police issued an official statement. Molly Tibbetts' body was found in Pawasha County, where Brooklyn was located. The parents identified their daughter. Investigators immediately noticed she was missing two items she always took with her, a smartphone and a fitness bracelet. Soon, the medical examiner made an official conclusion. The girl was attacked by several blows with a sharp object. This further shocked the residents of Brooklyn. They all knew each other and could not even think that there was a violent criminal among them. The newspapers also broke the story, making the whole of America talk about it. Solution to this gruesome crime was not long in coming. Almost immediately after the discovery of the body, police arrested 24-year-old Christy Rivera, an illegal migrant from Mexico who had come to the United States illegally seven years before the incident. All the time he had worked on various farms, hiding under the name John Butt. Police came to the Riviera after reviewing camera footage near the route mall usually ran. In the footage, they spotted a Chevy Malibu car driving back and forth on the road with no apparent purpose. It's possible to say with certainty how the police got the confession. According to the official version, Riviera immediately confessed to what he had done as soon as they came in with questions. According to his story, he was driving by the road along which Molly was running. He took a fancy to the girl and drove by her several more times. Apparently, it was these movements that the police noticed on the surveillance cameras. At one point, he stopped the car, got out, and ran alongside Molly. At the same time, he began harassing her verbally trying to gain the girl's affection. Molly did not like it and throw and to call the police. When the girl reached for her phone, Riviera attacked her. He then dumped her body in a cornfield and fled. Already under arrest, Riviera suddenly changed this strategy and claimed that he remembered nothing of that night. It is possible that his lawyer persuaded him to withdraw his confession. The charges against Riviera were filed on August 20th 2nd. At the trial, which began on September 19th, he pleaded not guilty. The trial dragged on for three years, largely thanks to the lawyers. Riviera's relatives hired two lawyers who tried all their might to get an acquittal or the Minimum possible punishment, the whole of America watched a trial. The thing is, this crime was committed during Donald Trump's presidential term. As many of you know, Trump has advocated stricter immigration laws, and it was Mexico, that he focused on the most. The Trump administration used the crime that Riviera committed to its advantage. The sad fate of Molly Tibbetts was cited as an example of why Trump's reforms are necessary for America. The girl's father spoke out strongly against his door to being used in political disputes. But number one listens to her father. 
One girl's story resounded across the country in the context of the immigration laws. After all, it is difficult not to agree that illegal migrants are a danger when literally under. The nose appears just such a case. The speed of the criminal trial was also affected by the pandemic and it wasn't until May 17, 2021 that the main part of the hearing began. Riviera continued to insist on his innocence, but he didn't stand a chance. On May 28, the court handed down its verdict, guilty of first-degree murder. Riviera received a maximum sentence for the state of Iowa, life in prison without parole. He will now spend many years in prison at the expense of American taxpayers. Politics aside, Molly Tippett's story once again shows us a sad truth danger can await. Anyone when they are not expecting it, and none of us are immune. Number 3. This incredible story, which began in 1977, shocked the world with its new month. 34 years later, a young mother took her six-month-old baby and went to a store near her home. She never returned home, and the police could find no trace of her. It took several decades for everyone to learn the truth and to see that such twisted plots do not only happen in the movies. This story began in the sunny American state of Hawaii. In early 1977, a young couple, 26-year-old Mark Barnes and 31-year-old Charlotte, Moriarty had a son named Marks. It seemed that a happy and carefree future awaited the family among palm trees, sunshine, and boundless ocean. Mark worked as a veterinarian, and Charlotte was an artist. The couple wasn't married, which didn't stop them from loving their child and giving him the best of everything. Before meeting Mark, Charlotte had been married and had a daughter who stayed to live with her father in New Mexico. After the divorce, her mother kept in contact with her and tried to visit her whenever possible. Fast forward to June 20th, 1st, 1977. On that day, Mark had been working on the property since early in the morning and the man was planting Charlotte's favorite flowers around it. The girl told him she wanted to walk to the store so as not to distract Mark from his work, she decided to take her son with her, put him in the stroller, and left. A few hours passed. Mark was so worked up that he didn't immediately realize. Charlotte should have been back by now since the store was only a few blocks away. After waiting a few more hours, he decided to walk to that store in hopes of meeting. Charlotte on the way. As he stepped away from the house, he saw his son's empty stroller standing near the bus stop. Neither the child nor Charlotte was anywhere to be found. It would seem that he should have gone to the police immediately after that, but Mark didn't. As he explained later, Charlotte could sometimes go somewhere for a few days, unannounced, and then returned home. The man decided that this time would be no exception. It sounds strange enough that if Charlotte had gone out alone, Mark's logic could still be understood, but she had taken her six-month-old baby with her, abandoned the stroller in the middle of the street, and seemed to have vanished. Two days passed, but Charlotte never showed up. Then Mark decided to call the police, and they advised him to wait a few more days. What if the girl and the baby still returned home? So he did. And two days later, he called the police again. This time, he was asked for a description of Charlotte and the child. And then they promised to start a search. But after that call, number one contacted Mark, and the fate of his girlfriend and son remained. A mystery. Three weeks passed. Mark decided to go to the police station to see how the search was going, and here the strangeness continued. There he was told that no calls had been received from him. The police allegedly couldn't find any evidence that Mark over the phone had told them about the missing girl and child. Of course, no case was open, and number one was looking for the missing all this time. List well on this point in more detail. Mark assured everyone that he had called the police twice. The police said that every call was registered and that there had simply been no calls. It is unclear which of them is right, but both scenarios are plausible. If the police really did refuse to start looking for the six-month-old, they could have been in serious trouble. Missing small children obliged the police to search immediately, even if only a few hours have passed since the disappearance. So in this case, the police may well have covered up the fact they did not search for the infant. The father's behavior also seemed strange. Why he wait several days before calling the police, and were there any such calls? Even if he did call, why did he wait three more weeks after those calls and only then decide to go to the station? After all, in all that time, he had even called there to find out anything about the 
Progress of the investigation. In this conversation with the detectives, Mark reported that Charlotte might have some kind of mental health problem. In the 70s, psychiatry was still gaining ground, so no treatment had been given to the girl. Neither she nor Mark even went to the hospital, even though there were very serious reasons to do so. According to Mark, Charlotte walked around the house for the first few weeks after giving birth with only a blindfold on and couldn't properly explain why. Given that there couldn't possibly be a logical explanation here, Mark was worried beyond belief and was already thinking about seeing doctors. But then Charlotte removed the blindfold and began to behave completely normally. The man decided to forget the story and not to pay any attention to it. That Charlotte's disappearance could be related to mental problems was indirectly suggested by another fact. Mark said that her daughter, who was eight years old at the time, was going to fly to Hawaii in June to visit her mother. Charlotte was looking forward to that meeting, but at the last minute, the girl's father canceled all plans in Charlotte that they will not come this summer. This very much upset the girl and mental disorders can be provoked by strong negative emotions that Charlotte experienced. Even in the quietest stages of a live person does not show any signs of unstable psyche. But all these theories did not bring the police any closer to finding the girl and her son. They opened a case, posted flyers all over the place, and couldn't find a single clue. Mark later recounted that for a year and a half after Charlotte and his son disappeared, he became obsessed with searching for them. He drove all over the island, hoping to find them alive and unharmed. But it never happened. Two years after they went missing, he moved to California nor did the police have much. Hope in the case, given the complete lack of evidence, number one believed that a girl and child could be found. Compounding the situation was the fact that crucial time for the had been lost in the first few days. 24 years had passed. Mark had started a new family, and he had two daughters. He had long ago stopped believing that he would one day see Charlotte and Mark's alive. But in 2001, the case took a new turn. Charlotte's daughter from her first marriage, Jennifer flew to Hawaii and went to the police station. She convinced them to reopen the case of her mother's disappearance. The detectives agreed, put Charlotte and Mark's information into the missing persons database and created a computer portrait of Mark's growing up based on his childhood photo. The first thing the detectives decided to do was to interrogate Mark because his behavior in the early stages of the investigation seemed strange to them. There was no mention in the old documents that the man had called the police station. By phone two days after the girl and child disappeared, it said he not come to the police station until three weeks later. This led detectives to believe that Mark may have been involved in their disappearance. Even though 24 years had passed since then, the police tried to find any witnesses who lived near Mark and Charlotte's home. Of course, most of the residents had already changed. But the detectives were lucky enough to find one senior citizen who had lived there back. Then, he remembered Mark and Charlotte and told the detectives an interesting fact. According to the pensioner, the couple often quarreled, and he heard them shouting. The detectives then decided that the case was getting close to a solution and Mark was indeed guilty. He was called in for questioning and told about the witness who had heard his regular arguments with Charlotte. Mark did not deny that there had indeed been verbal altercations between them. He also asked to see a married couple who would never fight. Detectives tried with all their might to prove his guilt and offered Mark to voluntarily undergo an interrogation with a polygraph. The results were ambiguous. The specialist who read the testimony could not give a clear answer whether the man was guilty or not. A pause graph is inherently an overrated instrument. It is not physically capable of showing whether a suspect is lying or not. Dozens of factor can affect its results can be mistaken for the truth and vice versa. If an innocent person is very nervous during an interrogation or withholds completely different information that is relevant to the questions, the polygraph can make him out to be a liar. In Mark's case, the polygraph was of no use there. But the detectives decided to go at it from a different angle. They obtained a warrant to examine the house where Charlotte and Mark lived in 1977. What interested them the most was the terrace, built shortly after the girl and child went missing. They speculated that Charlotte might not have gone anywhere that day, but might have been hurt by her husband in another quarrel and ended up in the ground under the terrace. It is not clear how the police imagined the events of that day and how an infant fits into 
the story, but they had no other versions. Forensic dug through the backyard and examined the terrace, but they were unable to find any trace of anyone's remains there. It is not known if they compensated the new owners of the house for the two days of digging in the backyard. The detectives admitted they had nothing else to work with and set the case aside. Again, as the last resort, they took DNA samples from Jennifer and Mark, hoping it would someday help. The case went into a long drawer again for a full 10 years, but after that time came the finale to this whole tangled story. Steve Carter, 35 of Philadelphia, had wondered about his past from an early age. He grew up in an orphanage, and at the age of four, he was installed by a wealthy new Jersey couple. The U.S. Army officer and his wife loved the baby and cared for him as their own. Steve also loved his foster parents, but he always wondered how he ended up in the orphanage. In 2011, he stumbled upon an internet article that told the amazing story of Caroline White, who had been kidnapped from the hospital when she was just 19 days old. Decades later, Caroline was browsing missing children's websites, found her childhood photo there, and realized with horror that it was her current parents who kidnapped her from the hospital. Steve Carter was inspired by the story and began researching the same sites. He entered his birth information on his certificate was immediately speechless. The first result showed an adult photo of him taken by artists based on a baby picture. Resemblance was so strong that Carter could not even move in shock. He realized he was the same Max Barnes who had gone missing in Hawaii with his birth mother. After recovering from his shock, Steve made the decision to take a DNA test, taking the opportunity through a missing child search service. Their database contained DNA samples of Mark and Jennifer taken by the police 10 years earlier. After eight months of waiting, the test showed an exact match. Steve Carter turned out to be Mark Barnes. Police instantly reopened the investigation. The missing infant found himself 34 years later, but the circumstances of his disappearance were still a mystery, but not for long. His birth certificate helped solve the mystery. First, the certificate was not issued until a year after the birth of the child. Second, his name was Tenzin Amaya, and his mother's name was Jane Amaya. That's what helped the police to connect the two key strands because that name had already appeared in the reports not long after Charlotte and the child disappeared. The police received a strange call. A woman reported that a girl with an infant baby had knocked on the door in her house and asked for milk to feed her. The police arrived on the believing that the girl was in an inadequate state. She was taken to a psychiatric clinic for evaluation, and the infant was handed over the guardianship authorities. This girl was Charlotte. After a few days in the hospital, she secretly escaped and was never seen again. And the child remained in the care of the state because he did not even have a birth certificate and it was impossible to identify his relatives. When the truth came out, everyone had a legitimate question. Why the police did not compare the disappearance of the girl and the baby to another? Situation especially when the infant was left in the care of the state. Couldn't they have realized that they had the very same child in front of them? Now, they 34 years later, it's hard to answer that question. Perhaps the police simply didn't know about the disappearance because the two cases, handled by two different precincts. Steve, who by then was working in a prestigious job and had a family of his own decided to make contact with his half-sister and biological father. They were shocked when the man revealed his own disappearance. Number one believed anymore that the infant might still be alive. Although we don't know what happened to Charlotte, the ending of the story can definitely be considered happy. Sat statistics tell us that the chances of finding missing children after so many years are zero, but the case of Marks Barnes was one of the rare exceptions he grew up in a wonderful family received a good upbringing, and became a successful man. Most likely, Charlotte was indeed suffering from serious mental disorder. She knocked on the door of a stranger asking for milk to feed her son. Perhaps the call to the police saved infant's life. Who knows how Charlotte's mental state would have changed in the future? It is still unknown what happened to her, and it is unlikely that the mystery will ever be solved, considering that she never tried to contact her husband or find her son, the woman could have died time after escaping from the asylum. Perhaps timely medical care could have changed the girl's condition for the better, and this whole story would have never happened. Number 4. In a small town, 
a 13-year-old girl disappeared, and her disappearance was not noticed. Until 24 hours later. This case could not be solved for more than 10 years, and only in the summer of 2021. It came to its conclusion. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Haley Dawn. This story took place in the American town of Colorado City, Texas. This place is a typical low-rise America, with an area of 14 square kilometers, only 4,000. People lived in the town. On Christmas Day 2010, the town had a New Year's atmosphere, residents decorated. Their homes participated in festive events and had fun. 13-year-old Haley Dunn was no exception. For Christmas, she was given a new iPad, which she was very happy about. Haley lived with her mom, Billy, and her boyfriend Sean and older brother dated. Her mother divorced her own father named Clint when the girl was 10 years old, but they never stopped communicating. In fact, her father lived literally across the street from Haley's house, so they saw each. Other almost every day, the girl was very close to her father and tried as often as possible to spend time with him. Family and friends described the girl as cheerful, funny, and energetic. She was a member of her school's cheerleading team, participated in athletics, and played the saxophone. Haley was also on three sports teams. On December 26th, the girl spent most of Christmas at her father's house unwrapping presents. Afterwards, she came home played video games, and went to bed. The next day, her stepfather and mother went to work. As usual, Billy left her cell phone at home so the children could contact her. Before she left, she peeked into her daughter's bedroom while she was still asleep. Sean was working in another town, which was about a half-hour drive away. According to him, he had an argument with his boss that day which resulted him being fired and leaving work just 10 minutes after he arrived. He then drove to his mother's house, spent some time there, and returned to Colorado City about 3 p.m. In the evening, Sean went to pick up Billy from work. When they arrived home, Billy noticed that her daughter wasn't home. Sean told her that the girl had gone into his room that afternoon and told him she was going to her father's house. After that, she planned to go to a friend's house and spend the night. Haley often stayed overnight at her friend's houses so her mother took this information. Calmly, small towns like this often have the illusion of safety, so parents are less worried that something might happen to their child. The next day, December 28th, Haley never came home. Billy decided to call the parents of a friend at whose house her daughter was supposed to spend the night. To her mother's surprise, they weren't even aware that Haley had planned to spend the night at their house. She hadn't shown up. It was further revealed that the girl hadn't even stopped by her father's house. Then, Billy got worried and decided to ask her neighbors if they had seen her daughter. She went door to door, and number one had seen the girl that day. Around 2 p.m., Billy went to the police, but they decided to take easiest route. The police's main theory was that she had run away from home, which initially hurt the investigation. A voluntary escape is not investigated on the same level as a missing minor. They searched Billy and Clint's homes and brought search dogs to the scene the next day. They picked up Haley's trail from the house to a local motel. It was very strange. None of the motel employees had seen this girl. She wasn't on any security cameras and a full search of the building yielded no results. Trained dogs pointed to a motel, but the girl apparently never showed up there. As news of Haley's disappearance spread through the city, dozens of concerned people joined the search. Some looked around the area, others printed and handed out flyers, and here we come to another strange moment. Clint, the girl's own father, practically never left the street. He looked in every corner, looked in every possible nook and cranny, even looked in dumpsters. According to him, he just couldn't sit at home and wait. Meanwhile, Billy and Sean were not so enthusiastic. The mother handed out flyers, but refused to go around the neighborhood looking for her daughter. She explained that searching gave her the impression that they were already looking for her body and that there was no chance of finding the girl alive. As for Sean, he took absolutely no part, but that's not the strangest thing either. On December 31st, for days after the girl went missing, Billy and Sean threw a New Year's Eve party. They had friends over, listening to music, drinking, and partying. Such behavior on the part of a mother whose daughter had disappeared without a trace seemed simply absurd. 
On January 3rd, a week after Haley's disappearance, the police finally officially declared her missing. This meant that more serious agencies such as the FBI and the Texas Rangers could become involved. And so it happened. Representatives of these agencies arrived in Colorado City and began their investigation. Volunteers continued to the area and more than a hundred billboards were posted throughout Texas and beyond about the missing girl. Detectives completely ruled out the possibility of an escape. For one thing, they could find no reason why Haley would choose to take such a step. The day before her disappearance, she had been in a fine mood. And for the rest of the time, the girl showed no signs that might indicate a tendency to run away. Secondly, absolutely all her belongings were left in the room. If the girl had decided to run away, she must have taken something with her. The detectives quickly realized that they should take a closer look at Billy and Sean. Their passive attitude toward the girl's search and the New Year's Eve party made one. Seriously wonder if they cared about Haley. Detectives discovered that on December 27th, the same day Haley allegedly spent the night at a friend's house, Sean and Billy had withdrawn $140 from their bank cards. They admitted that the money was used to purchase illegal substances, which the couple had taken that evening, taking advantage of the absence of their children from home. On January 6th, it was reported that police had questioned Billy and Sean using a polygraph. The results were very interesting. Billy failed on two attempts. During the first interrogation, she was under the influence of substances, and the second result showed her lying. Sean also failed two interrogations, and from the third, he simply walked away before he even finished answering the questions. And after that, Billy suspected that Sean might be involved in her daughter's disappearance and demanded that he move out of her home. On January 12th, police officially announced that Sean was being treated as a suspect. Several facts helped them come to this conclusion. First, it became known that the couple's relationship had been strained at times. During some of their arguments, Sean had threatened Billy and her daughter with violence. Secondly, among his belongings were found many sheets on which was printed information about serial killers. It later turned out that he and Billy had taken an interest in similar topics together. Next, the police examined the geolocation data from Sean's phone and found that his Account of the day Haley disappeared did not match reality. He did arrive at work where he stayed for 10 minutes except that afterwards, Sean didn't go to his mother's house as he had said before, but headed back to Colorado City, to Billy's house. It wasn't until some time later that he drove to his mother's house. Here is worth bearing in mind that the police tracked the phone so vassal towers, which have a range of several miles, so detectives could only roughly estimate where Sean might have been. On top of that, it turned out that he wasn't fired. He left on his own initiative. The man arrived at work, told his bosses he was leaving, and headed back to Colorado City. After interviewing Haley's friends and other acquaintances, detectives found even creepier details. The girl repeatedly spoke of being afraid of Sean. Haley admitted to her best friend that she preferred to spend time outside or at friends' houses because she didn't feel safe around Sean. She once told her grandmother that she often saw Sean standing in front of her bedroom door in the middle of the night. Each time, she was afraid he would come into the room. Soon, the police became aware of a conversation with Haley's uncle. Discussing the girl's disappearance, her uncle said roughly the following, I can't believe anyone would hurt a child. Sean's response was extremely strange. He said, it's like killing a deer. With all this information in hand, the detectives concluded that Haley had not lived in the most prosperous family. Her mother and stepfather often drank and used illegal substances and threw parties. Sean's behavior seemed highly suspicious, but there was no direct evidence against him. Eventually, the police contacted Child Welfare, who made the decision to remove Haley's older brother. On February 24th, police searched the house in which Sean lived with Billy, as well as his mother's house. A huge discovery awaited them. They found more than 100,000 obscene images of minors on a removable drive and hard drive. The police also seized his laptop, but apparently didn't have time to examine its contents. Sean's father came to the station and demanded his son's equipment back. It is not known for what reason, but the police did, but that is not the most interesting part. 
Sean received no punishment for so much illegal material on his computer on March. 17. Police officers went to Billy's house to ask Sean some questions. A woman opened the door and said he wasn't home, but the officer showed her a prearranged warrant and entered the premises, finding Sean hiding there. For concealing a suspect, Billy received 90 days in jail and a year of corrections time. She was sent to a correctional facility in Travis County. Upon her release, she stayed in the area with Sean. In 2012, however, the couple finally broke up. Billy began to seriously think that Sean might be involved in her daughter's disappearance. Since then, the case had effectively stalled. The police had no new evidence. Volunteers could find no trace of the girl. This continued until March 16, 2013, when a hiker discovered human remains near Lake J. B. Thomas in Scary County. And experts conducted the necessary tests and determined that the remains belonged to Haley Dunn. Her body was about 20 miles from her home. Police have not disclosed the cause of death, but sources say it could be blunt force. Trauma. After the discovery of the body, the investigation boiled over again. Authorities offered a $15,000 reward for any information leading to the capture of the culprit. Their eyes turned back to Sean, but nothing had changed since the girl disappeared. The police simply didn't have direct evidence against him, but they had circumstantial evidence. The girl's body had been found only a few miles from Sean's mother's house that matched the geolocation data on his phone because they are determined by the towers. Given such a short distance, Sean could very well have left the body in said area, and number one would have known about it. Moreover, he grew up in the area and could easily orientate where it was best to hide the body. But the investigators could not find any other clues and the case was frozen again for many years. Despite this, the girl's family had to wait four years to bury her remains. A memorial service was held in January 2017. In 2018, Haley's father, Clint, said he believed Sean and Billy were guilty. In his version, his mother either helped cover up the truth or was directly involved in the murder. In the same year, he began giving numerous interviews and tried to actively publicize the case. The man said that in the early years of the investigation, he tried not to pester the police with constant questions, but his patience had run out. The detectives did little to investigate and his last hope was to spread the word widely. In an effort to bring the perpetrators to justice, and it did pay off. In 2019, an unknown person wrote to Clint and told him that in 2011, he had found several items that might have belonged to Haley. At the time, this person was in high school and hadn't heard about the missing girl, so it didn't even occur to him to report his find to the police. True, information about the items has not yet been disclosed. The police have not disclosed what the items are. Clint only mentioned that they were found in an area that had been repeatedly combed by volunteers and police. Some time later, new information emerged. Private investigator Erica Moore, who was handling the Haley case and kept in touch with Clint, presented some very creepy information related to Sean. In October 20, 19, she began receiving messages from various women in Texas. They all said they were being harassed online in an aggressive manner by a man registered under the name Casey. Not only was he harassing them with lewd messages, but he was also sending them explicit photos and videos of himself. Given that Sean had the same middle name, Erica asked the women to send her photos and videos of the man sending the girls. Her theory was confirmed. It really was Sean. She persuaded one woman to go to the police station and file a report on Sean, but they refused to press charges and even accused the woman of falsifying the facts. Erica's plan was simple. She was convinced that Sean was involved in Haley's death. Given that the police couldn't arrest him for it, the story of stalking women on the internet could have put a potentially dangerous criminal behind bars at least for a while. But that plan didn't work. The case went quiet again until something really unexpected happened in May 20, 21. Erica and Clint were invited to the district attorney's office for an urgent talk. There, they received the long-awaited announcement. Hagley's killer would be arrested in June. Of course, this information was not disclosed after the meeting. It was kept secret until June 14, 2021, when after 10 years of waiting, the arrest finally happened. Police took Sean into custody and charged him with the murder of Haley. 
He is currently in bail awaiting trial on $20 million bail, but police are still not disclosing what new evidence allowed them to make this arrest. Apparently, this information is being kept secret until the trial. All we know now is that shortly before the arrest, the police received permission to take a DNA sample from Sean. There may be some connection here to Haley's belongings, which were found back in 2011. Upon learning of her ex-boyfriend's arrest, Billy made a very strange statement. She said she wasn't the least bit surprised that Sean was involved in the murder and added that she wanted to believe in his innocence until the last minute. She also thanked God that the man would now be punished for what he had done, which Billy herself had actively obstructed during the early investigation defending Sean. A date for the trial is to be announced in the near future. At this point, it's hard to say whether a conviction will be obtained. It will depend solely on the significance of the evidence that police are now withholding. In any case, Sean spent more than 10 years at large, even though everything pointed to his involvement in the murder. Haley's complaints to friends and relatives, forbidden materials with children, and constant lies during interrogations. The man looked suspicious on all sides. As for Billy? She initially showed no desire to get justice for her daughter. Clint, unlike her, put forth his best efforts and got his way. Erica Moore in one interview hinted that the case would not have been solved without his active participation. She didn't give any details, but here again, we can remember the story of Haley's found. Objects. The person who discovered them only found out about the whole story, thanks to Clint's social media posts. More details of this case, and most importantly, a court decision are sure to come our way in the near future. Right now, all indications are that Sean could really get a conviction and in Texas that would mean only one thing, a guaranteed death penalty for what he did to the child. Too bad there's no way this is going to help Haley Dunn live a long and happy life. Number 5. A 16-year-old girl who lived in the same house as her parents and younger sisters had gone to sleep in her room and in the morning she was found dead. The police immediately realized they were dealing with the murder, but none of her relatives heard anything that night. It took 31 years to finally solve the case, but number one was prepared for this turn of events. Fawn Cox was born March 20, 4, 1973 in Kansas City, Missouri. Her parents soon had two more daughters. The family lived in a small two-story house located in a rough residential neighborhood. From an early age, she helped her parents take care of the younger children, went to church regularly, and enjoyed swimming. When she turned 16, Fawn got a part-time job at a local amusement park. Her family lived quite poor, and the girls sought to earn at least some money in her spare time from school. She spent most of the summer vacations of 1989 at work. Mostly, the girls stood behind the cash register and sold tickets to amusement rides. On Wednesday, July 26th, she finished her shift at about 10 p.m. Her mother and younger sister picked her up in the car as it would have taken a long time to get from the park to her home on public transportation. Almost immediately after returning home, Fawn went to bed since she had to go to work again the next morning. The girl slept on the second floor. She had her own room. Her sisters usually slept in the next room, but that night, she was alone on the floor. Her sister Amber, who was only a year younger, was babysitting for a familiar family. That night, the other sister, Felicia, decided to sleep on the first floor because it was much cooler. There, it was a very hot night, and the only air conditioner working was downstairs, and there, parents also slept on the first floor. The next morning at about 9 o'clock, the whole family woke up to the sound of the alarm clock in Fawn's room, but the girl wouldn't turn it off for some reason. Then her younger sister and mother went up to her room, where a horrible sight awaited them. Fawn lay on the bed with no sign of life, her neck visibly bruised. The girl also had no pulse, and her parents immediately called an ambulance, but they were no longer able to help her. It was apparent that Fawn had passed away hours before. After examining her body, medical experts determined this triangulation was the cause of death, and the girl had also been abused. From the first hours, the police realized they had a very difficult investigation ahead of them. Despite the fact that Fawn was killed right in her room in a small house with very poor soundproofing, her parents and sister heard absolutely nothing. However, there was an explanation. 
The air conditioner on the first floor was old and very loud, blocking out any other noise. In the house, the only strange thing that night was noticed by Fawn's sister. Their poodle was behaving anxiously and barking, but they did not pay much attention to it. This behavior was attributed to the fact that the dog was pregnant. After examining the scene, the police made several important discoveries. Their theory was that the attacker or group had entered the house through a second story window overlooking the backyard. There was an old trailer park near the house that could easily be used to climb up to. The canopy of the outbuilding, which was almost level with the window. The window itself had been left open because there was no air conditioning on the second floor and one had to fight the heat somehow. In Fawn's room, the experts found the first important clues, a few short hairs, small bloodstains, and traces of semen on the sheet from her bed. All of this was sent to the lab for analysis. In addition, several items were missing from the house, including radios, a Nintendo, game console, and a stereo recorder. The several other items were found on the ground in front of the house. It looked as if the burglar had thrown them out the window to take them with him, but left them there. For some reason, detectives also found that various items had been removed from a closet in an adjoining room on the second floor. They believed the perpetrator was hiding in that closet while waiting for everyone in the house to go to sleep. Normally, Fawn's sister slept in that room, but not that night. For this reason, number one noticed the items on display. The police discovered another strange clue. An old army cap was found in Fawn's room. All her relatives said they had never seen the girl wearing it, so detectives assumed the killer might have forgotten the cap at the scene. Despite the impressive array of evidence, police were unable to quickly identify the suspects. The problem is that in 1989, DNA forensics was rather underdeveloped, and there were no common genetic databases at that time. Detective Benjamin Caldwell, who handled the case, put forward the main version of what happened. In his opinion, there could have been several assailants, and they must have known the house well. Not only did they know how to get to the second floor through the backyard in total darkness, but they must also have known the layout of the rooms. The next step for the police was to look for witnesses. They interviewed neighbors, friends, and relatives of Fawn, but all were inconclusive. The detectives had one weighty problem before them. The neighborhood in which the house was located was very poor and criminal. Various criminal gangs separated there, and their participants were quite difficult to bring to justice. A month after Fawn's murder, the case finally got off the ground. The police had a witness who pointed them to three suspects. This witness knew a number of important details that the police never divulged, so his story was taken seriously. The suspects were three teenagers, one of whom was in the same class as Vaughn. They were arrested and questioned, but the boys denied any involvement in the murder. During a search of one of their homes, police found items stolen from the victim's room. This was enough to charge all three of them with murder, but even here, the detectives were disappointed. First, the witness suddenly recanted and stopped cooperating with the police. Second, DNA analysis of blood, hair, and semen found at the crime scene did not show an unambiguous match with the suspect's samples. In those years, experts could not yet establish an exact match of the samples and all. Their tests showed questionable results. In other words, the analysis could not confirm either a full match or a guaranteed mismatch. Despite this, the police were able to obtain useful information from one of the detainees. During one of the interrogations, he confessed that he had indeed broken into Fott's house that night in the company of other boys and stolen some things. He painted how he made his way to the second floor through the canopy of the canopy and even revealed unknown details. According to him, when he threw a tape recorder out the window, its handle fell off. The boy hid it under a nearby bush, and the police did find the item in that very spot. Except that the young man quickly retracted his statement and no longer cooperated. With the investigation, which would have prevented his confession from being used in court. Because of this, the police had to let the men go, and the investigation was at a standstill again. Most likely, the witnesses were simply intimidated, but without their testimony in court, the case had almost no chance. All we know is that one of them spent eight months in jail for stealing items from Fawn's house. The case has since gone into a long drawer.
The police didn't reopen the investigation until the early 2000s. And the first thing they did was upload DNA samples from the crime scene to the CODIS database. It had been created several years before and contained DNA samples from people tried for serious crimes. Unfortunately, no matches were found for the Fawn killer. The emergence of this database was the result of major scientific advances in the study of DNA. It also allowed police to recollect DNA samples from the three original suspects and conduct more advanced tests. This time, experts unequivocally determined that the hair semen and blood did not belong to any of them. This was rather odd given the fact that the suspects were found in possession of fonts. Belongings. Detectives speculated that the three guys had indeed robbed her house at night, but was another man with them. He was the one who had abused and killed the girl. All of this raised even more questions. Could it be that four criminals entered the house unnoticed, killed Fawn, and just as unnoticed left the scene of the crime? The police still had no answer to this question. Since then, the case has once again stalled. With each passing year, the Fawn family believed less and less that the murder would ever be solved. They continued to believe that those three suspects had been in their house at night and could point to the killer, but would never do so. The only thing that could help them learn the truth was a DNA sample stored in the police lab. In 2018, something interesting happened. Amber, Fawn's younger sister, revealed some disturbing details about the crime. She put her thoughts and facts unknown to the police on a popular American forum for unsolved crimes. Over the 20 years of its existence, the forum had gained a very reliable reputation and, as participants have helped the police solve several high-profile cases, Amber has been verified and confirmed that she really is who she says she is, so her post is worthy of attention. She herself worked as a nanny from Monday to Friday and was only at home during the day. On weekends, the girl slept in the very room on the second floor through which the burglars had snuck in. Accordingly, the criminals would have been immediately spotted. In addition, they would have watched the house and waited until Fawn's mother and her younger sister went to pick up the girl from work. Despite all this, Amber's story didn't bring the case any closer to solving it. But it was already 2018, and the science of DNA research had come a long way. Dozens, if not hundreds of long-forgotten cases were being solved, thanks to new analysis tools. Fawn's relatives saw it all and resented why the police were in no hurry to reopen the murder investigation. They kept talking to detectives about the case, and each time they got the same. Answer, extended DNA testing requires money, and the police have dozens of cases. For that reason, the relatives were left to wait for their turn and funding to come in. But they decided to take the initiative and launched a fundraiser in 2019. The family wanted to cover the full cost of the DNA samples and also offered a $10,000 reward for any information that would lead to the perpetrator's capture. Due to the extensive media coverage of the case and numerous interviews given by the family, many people who cared respond to request for help. The family quickly collected the necessary amount of money, but even here, they were disappointed. The police department refused to initiate this investigation at the expense of the relatives of the victim. The lead detective explained that there was bound to be a big problem in such a situation. If the relatives of one victim could pay for such tests and expedite the results, then hundreds of other families who have been searching for years for the murder of their loved ones should have the same right. But it is simply impossible to implement such a thing in practice. Since only a few laboratories in the world conduct innovative DNA tests, and with such a simultaneous influx of those wishing to do so, their resources are simply not enough. The leading company in this field is Parabon Nanolabs, which we have already repeatedly mentioned in the other reels. They have made tremendous progress in the study of DNA from finding a person's relatives from the smallest genetic samples to creating an approximate portrait of the owner of the DNA. It was this lab that was to take over the study of the samples left in Font Bedroom the night she was murdered. The girl's relatives believed that the police were in no hurry to pursue their case for another reason. They were a poor family from a bad neighborhood, and murder was not a priority for investigators there. In an interview, Sister Fawn said that if it had been a murder of a family of rich or high-ranking people, all the necessary investigations would have been done instantly.
Unfortunately, they never managed to expedite the process, and it wasn't until late 2020 that the long-awaited breakthrough happened, but the family wasn't ready for that. Kind of truth. With funding from the FBI, the police did send samples from Vaughn's room to a lab. There, they began a detailed examination of the DN and a search for possible relative of its possessors. It was the semen sample found at the murder scene that they mostly worked within. November 20th, 20, they are finally able to find the person to whom that DNA belonged. It turned out to be Fawn's cousin, Donald's Cox. Of course, such news shocked the whole family. At the time of Fawn's death, Donald was 21 years old, and number one had even considered his possible involvement. That said, Donald was a pretty troubled man and was constantly behind bars. He was tried for misdemeanors such as theft and possession of illegal substances. Unfortunately, in those years, they did not yet take a DNA sample from such criminals. Otherwise, this case would have been solved much earlier. Donald died of an overdose in 2006, but the police investigated his death because certain circumstances seemed suspicious to them. It was because of that investigation that a sample of his DNA was preserved, but it was not entered into the FBI database because the man in that case was a victim, not a perpetrator. Once the experts informed the police of their discovery, they matched the Sam with a semen found at the murder scene and got a 100% match. Despite the gravity of this discovery, the relatives have received an answer to a question that has plagued them for 31 years, but there remained one very important point in the whole story. A great deal of evidence indicated that the three original suspects had also been in the Fawn house that night. It was now becoming clear how the perpetrators knew the house and the family's routines so precisely. Donald was a frequent visitor and knew all these nuances. However, the police closed the case and no new charges were filed against the three men. Sister Fawn said she saw no point in trying to get a confession out of them, even though the men had been present in the house at night. They may not have even witnessed the murder itself. Donald may well have stayed in the house alone and only then attacked Fawn, Felicia. Added that the three suspects had already paid for their act. Throughout this time, while the case remained unsolved, the entire neighborhood was 100% certain of their guilt. Because of this, they were treated very negatively, with all the consequences that would follow. According to Sister Fawn, their lives were effectively ruined. In addition, after the case was closed, it turned out that the police had originally learned about the suspects from the family of one of them. Relatives noticed a Nintendo set box among his belongings and remembered that this was the one that had been stolen from Fuan's house. It was on the news and everyone in the neighborhood already knew the details. In any case, it is simply impossible to prove their guilt. And the relatives of the victim finally know the name of the killer. He lived for 17 years without any punishment for what he had done and all that time. As if nothing had happened, communicated with his family, but eventually his addiction to illegal substances drove him to his grave, and he was no longer a threat to anyone. Share your opinion on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like the video and subscribe our channel.